This is Current Reflections, a production of Tribal College, Journal of American Indian Higher Education. For this installment of Current Reflections, we are joined by Janine Peace, founding president of Little Bighorn College. I'm Bradley Sharif. Janine Peace has blazed trails for all women leaders in the Tribal College movement. Dr. Peace wove Crow culture and values throughout Little Bighorn's curriculum with native language revitalization playing an especially prominent role. More broadly, Peace's research on indigenous language revitalization has had a profound effect on the entire tribal college movement. She has authored several articles and studies on the subject, including the American Indian College Fund's report, Native American Language Immersion. Dr. Pease investigated language curricula at immersion schools around the world and showed how such programming could be applied successfully at tribal colleges. Through her research, Dr. Pease has helped change the course of native language learning in North America. It is our honor today to have Janine Pease here for this installment of Current Reflections on language sustainability at tribal colleges and universities. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Pease. Well, thanks very much for having me. I appreciate being on today. Great. So I want to begin by clearing up some semantical issues. So can you clarify for our listeners the differences, as you see it, between language preservation, language revitalization, and language sustainability? Well, these will be uh, the way in which I use them, and we have used them here on the Crow Reservation with the Absaloka language. We organized a Crow language consortium, and so we, uh, for the last uh, 10 years, we've been talking about these things among our teachers, our school administrators, the college personnel, and members of our broader Absaloka uh, speaker community. So I look at preservation and we look at preservation as the kind of effort to um, protect what resources we have in our language. So our college, Little Bighorn College has an extensive archives. In our archives, we have somewhere around uh, three to 4,000 audio and video recordings, most of which are in the Absaloka language by primary Absaloka speakers. Um, these would consist of presentations, but they can also uh, consist of major events recorded, maybe two or three hours long. Some of the uh, recordings are much longer than that. For example, a night at Crow Fair, um, all the announcers and all the events are discussed and, and um, introduced in the Crow language. But we also have games, our hand games, our arrow games are recorded. So preservation of those kinds of events, the speaking of the language in within the, the tradition of the Absaloka people. Uh, we, so we continue to have that kind of preservation. Um, once a week, we have a speaker, a primary crow speaker. Now the speakers sometimes are speaking in English, and then they'll they'll also speak in Absalica. So preservation is taking advantage of preserving and protecting those language resources that are throughout the community. And you know, some of these recordings were made in the 1920s and 30s on wire. And so we've gone to the effort of collecting um, recordings from members of our own community, our speaker community, but as well as bring them in from other archives. And I'll move to revitalization. Revitalization is bringing in new speakers or strengthening speakers who have perhaps some conversation, knowledge of the language, but who are uh, wanting to advance their language skills. And so revitalization includes activities like training teachers, who are teaching students of all ages from you know, preschool all the way through uh, our Little Bighorn College, the uh, 
uh, freshman and sophomore Crow language classes. Um, it's also uh, our language immersion classes, our language immersion uh, classes in all, both public and private schools, wherever they are, um, developing materials for those classes. So I look at that as revitalization. Now, sustainability. Um, this has to do with sustaining the language strength in our community. This has intention involved with it. That is events that are particularly and intentionally conducted and encouraged to be conducted in the Crow language in all settings, whether it's in family settings, talking to families about uh, making sure that their family has language as a part of their uh, all of their family events, rewarding speakers who speak well. Our college has given uh, rewards or awards, uh, scholarships and recognition to students who come in and who are able to speak. Um, so sustaining what language is in our community, that that is, and it, it, there is a fine line between each of these. And I think every community has to, you know, grapple with all of these kinds of activities. But working in language, it involves all of these three areas. Yeah. Uh, and you've been doing so for so long. Going back to 1980, when you became president of Little Bighorn College, what was the state of native languages and native language curricula at tribal colleges and elsewhere? Well, among the tribal colleges, there was quite a variety of fluency among the, the student population we expected to serve. You know, on some reservations, there are few, if any, speakers, but on others, uh, at Crow, for example, we, we look back and see that we had about 40 to 50 percent of our students coming in our charter, our early years, uh, we chartered in 1980. So between uh, 1980 and 1985 or 86, we had about 40 percent, maybe some years as many as 50 percent of our students were fluent speakers. Well, um, there and so there are probably a couple of other settings where their percentage of speakers was higher than that. And that setting gave us the opportunity as we were newly chartered as a tribal college to actually have many classes instructed in the Crow language. Um, I remember writing reports, I recall writing reports for accreditation saying that all of our tribal studies classes were instructed in the Crow language. Um, we had a, a series of classes, probably 15 classes, that were in our tribal studies series that included the languages classes. But I think that varied uh, across the 12 to 16 colleges that were existing when I entered the environment of tribal colleges. Now, when we started our college at Little Bighorn, we wanted very much to have the Crow language required of every single associate degree, whether it was arts or science, and one language class for those certificate programs. And we structured that from the very beginning. We also had both humanities and social sciences classes that came from tribal studies, many of which were instructed in the Crow language. For example, uh, oral history and oral literature were instructed in the Absaloka language and still are today. Uh, also music and dance, those were instructed in the Crow language and still are today. Uh, I think that many of the tribal colleges had a similar approach to the language teaching and the teaching of Crow, or I mean of history, culture and language um, in their curriculum. Um, and it's been a while since I've surveyed the tribal colleges on that, but I, I've had uh, the opportunity to look at the co tribal colleges in Montana, North and South Dakota, more than many of the others. And I see that this is the kind of curriculum that represents the culture, and it's right at the heart of what the, the tribal colleges present in their entire curriculum. Yeah. 
I know you did a lot of research on immersion schools in New Zealand and Hawaii. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience and what lessons were learned? How did you apply that to tribal colleges? Well, in the in the years uh, 2001 to 2003, I was commissioned to research uh, language immersion in Native America and First Nations Canada in Native Hawaii and in um, Maori New Zealand. And uh, it was a tremendous opportunity to observe the way in which language is a part of uh, these indigenous institutions, whether they were language nests for preschool children or they were elementary, intermediate or secondary schools or tribal colleges. The whole, I had an opportunity to observe all of those educational levels. And I was uh, relatively unacquainted at that time with language immersion. I think that was the huge learning curve that I had as a researcher. I, uh, I specifically interviewed parents and teachers and community members where immersion schools had been started uh, and were continuing. And many of the places I visited in Hawaii and New Zealand, for example, their schools had actually graduated students in immersion schools right up to the high school graduation level and were then entering the uh, post-secondary environment, studying everything in the uh, Maori language, the, the native Hawaiian language. So I was very, um, very, it was an immersion experience of, uh, <laughs> you might say, an, on, be, on my behalf to understand the importance, the essential integral importance of the language as a means of education, not just learning the language, that certainly is important, but all functions of education in the financial aid office, among the parents, in their parent meetings, um, in the learning of sciences, social sciences, literatures, all of those classes took place uh, in the indigenous language. So that was that was really tremendous. I think I, um, um, it, as I recall, meeting the teachers was probably among the most important uh, areas of gaining knowledge about immersion because every setting demanded a tremendous amount of creativity on behalf of teachers. The, the curriculum simply weren't available. There weren't sets of curriculum. So the teachers were um, very involved, even like overnight preparing for the next day. I remember speaking to an immersion uh, teacher in an uh, immersion nest, a language nest in Hawaii, who said I would I wanted to put language in music because the kids learned it so just immediately. And sometimes I'd spend all evening putting a song together with a certain number of vocabulary. And I was teaching it the next day. That kind of willingness and courage to, to be creative on the spot, I noted among the teachers. But I also noted among parents, the activism. I mean, they put no matter where. Uh, I interviewed people in Blackfeet, uh, um, Daryl Kipp on the schools that he organized at Blackfeet, where parents had to step forward and organize schools, find facilities, raise money, write grant proposals, and so on. That kind of activism is so, um, so I really find that so awesome. So where people have the intention and the commitment to see that classrooms are open, or entire schools. Um, so that those are some of the things that I uh, I was able to communicate in my uh, writing uh, for the American Indian College Fund about what was involved with language immersion. Another aspect is the way in which language immersion schools looked at elders, their knowledge of the language and the culture and the history as a veritable library of materials. And they, they were not relying on elders to be the teachers. They were relying on elders to be the resource, you know, the keepers of knowledge. And it was utterly and completely respectful of elders. 
was an over, uh, uh, you know, relying on elders when they really couldn't do eight hours a day. They they had to do maybe visits with elders, but so many elders were involved in all these immersion settings. So those are some of the things that I um, I came to know doing this research. I also came to know that it is entirely possible for whole communities of people to acquire the the indigenous not the indigenous knowledge of the language and conduct their classrooms in the language conduct their families their homes uh, raising their children and more than that you know community meetings and community gatherings in the language where it hadn't existed before hmm. yeah that's so important because language is you know ways of knowing are embedded in, in, in language. So that's, that's good to hear that. So more recently, you have served as the principal investigator at the Crow Nation's Chickadee Lodge Immersion School. What did you discover to be some of the most effective immersion strategies? You know, I think that immersion is one of the biggest teachers we have to pick up and run with in Indian country. It is, um, and what I know is mainly directly from the teachers that we were able to hire for the language immersion classroom. We had K through three, and the teachers were uh, utilizing textbooks that we had been developing over a period of time. So we had, we were able to use flashcards and, uh, a vocab builder that was online. We had CDs and DVDs that we had the kids listen to with their teachers. The teachers had a series of contextual posters, just the way children learn. They learn about my home and everything in it, my classroom and my teacher and all the things that are in my classroom or all the parts of my face or all the parts of my body. So we had all this series of great big well-illustrated posters that were colorful and great. Um, but we found that our teachers were able to teach even more than the materials that we had developed and had in the classroom by teaching the children a series of 38 lullabies that had animal stories and animal behavior in there. They had warrior stories and some of the ways in which warriors achieve. They uh, also understood what what songs were sung when crows gathered together? Our children learned warrior songs and the uh, flag song. They learned round dances, and they had a they had a repertoire of eight or ten round dance songs. They absolutely loved singing. When there was any downtime in the classroom, they all uh, began singing with their teachers. But also, our teachers told them stories of history, stories of individuals like profiles of people in our community, in our history. Uh, and they told them the, the, the oral history, you might call them the legends. And we found also that our children love to play games and games have all kinds of aspects of learning in them. Terminology, numbers, actions, um, orders from the coach, and so we played native games. Uh, there were so many ways in which learning was achieved. We went well beyond what, what you might think of as a typical classroom. We also did a lot of field learning. We went to places, cultural places and historic places on a reservation with the children and interpreted these places of importance, people importance to those places. and all of the things that were there in those places, the trees, the flowers, the birds, the animals. So it was really a surround learning kind of a, an experience. And we had plenty of resources. We were fortunate because we had a, a bus. We, had, uh, we could pay our children's way into one area or another. We could retain elders to interpret sites with us. So there was plenty of learning that we did. It was a, an enormous thing to learn. We also learned that we wanted to have a certain vocabulary, building blocks of, of, of learning the language. We wanted to acquire about 
800 to 1,000 words a year with our children that they could acquire them. And we felt that was a huge mountain. But we realized that with the music, with the games, with the stories, um, we more than acquired a thousand words a year. So the children, by the time they were done with their three years of language immersion, they had acquired about a vocabulary of something like 3,000 words. And then we had uh, conversational kinds of uh, exercises to learn those very important conversations. We also used sign language. You know, we learned um, there's a individual in our community who's developed American Plains Indian uh, sign language with vocabulary of the of Salakia language. And so the children would watch 25 to 30 terms and signs every morning while they were getting ready for their uh, lessons to uh, the more formal classroom setting. And uh, this series delivers 400 terms. Uh, with signs. So not only were we helping the children acquire a language vocabulary in Ipsaloka, but also the sign language, which is used cr uh, tremendous, uh, tremendously across our community in, in, uh, in among family members, in big community events, and so on. But it's very reinforcing, you know, to have action with a word is like a double learning power. So that was another learning uh, uh, learning tool that was very important. So those are some of the things that was, it was quite an experience and we weren't refunded because of our funding source were, did not allow us to reapply. And so we, we had to close our school, but there are immersion classrooms in 14 locations, um, you know, on the Crow Reservation. It wasn't that we just closed it and that was the end of language immersion. Our students went on to uh, language immersion classrooms in the same school where our immersion school was, had, was located. Janine Peace is the founding president of Little Bighorn College. We'll continue our discussion on language sustainability at tribal colleges and universities in just a moment. Hey, this is Marvin Tom, the Advertising Coordinator for the Tribal College Journal. Since 1989, TCJ has earned a loyal following of readers who are passionate about American Indian education. Our dynamic media outlet reaches a diverse, wide-ranging market, including students, educators, and lawmakers. And here's the best part. TCJ offers a variety of reasonable price advertising options that can be placed in our magazine, on our website, or right here in our current Reflection podcast. For more information, contact me at 970-764-4238 or at marvine at travelcollegejournal.org. Yeah. This is Current Reflections, and I'm speaking with Janine Peace, founding president of Little Bighorn College. Well, it sounds like you had some great um, curriculum there at Chickadee. Outside of the immersion school setting, how can TCUs motivate young people and families to use and maintain native languages? Well, it seems to me, and I know this from having visited the tribal colleges, is that there are language learning opportunities that are almost all required um, in the tribal colleges. So students who do take those language classes can acquire um, some very basic conversation. And they can, uh, I think language teachers can do talk to them about their, um, their opportunity to acquire the language. Um, it is true that with all of our classrooms, in all these 14 classrooms where language immersion is happening, and that's all across our reservation in grades K through three, families are brought in for family nights. And those family members, those moms and dads, are members of our students at Little Bighorn College. So, I mean, there's ways 
language classes at the college, at the tribal college. But when there's language immersion in the schools, we as a as a language consortium have put together family language learning nights where the family members come in as a unit, mom, dad, or grandma and her daughter and their and her daughter's three children, the family units come in and they and we have family learning. We have activities that they they can learn or games they can play and then they take the games home. And uh, our uh, our language consortium has developed 23 games that our families can pick up at the family language learning nights and take them with uh, them home to play around the kitchen table with all the members of the family. And every game delivers about 20 to 30 vocabulary words and in function so there's visuals, there's, you know, playing pieces, like we have a game that's called the color of horses. And we have 12 horses that family members can use. And it's kind of like shoots and ladders. If you ever played that game with your kids, oh, places yeah. horses go, yeah, places horses go from the field to the barn, to the crow fairgrounds, to the racetrack, and so on. And everybody has to say those destinations that horses have in a year, and then they they uh, roll the dice to see how many spaces they can move on this path. So they learn the color of the horse horses. All these horses are different colors from, um, you know, they might be a paint horse or a brown or a sorrel or, a, um, you know, uh, all the different uh, terms for horses in the Crow language. And so they learn that as well as the places that horses go. And horses are so, so important to the Cat people. That's just one example of a, of a game that we sent home with our families. And we encourage our, our families to play this eight or 10 times a month till they get the, the words. And it can become a family favorite. Instead of playing, you know, Monopoly or something else, they can play The Color of Horses. Huh. That's very exciting. Yeah, but it's a family function. It can't just happen at school. It's got to go home. Language use has to go home and be among the family members. Otherwise, you know, it becomes, it's limited, you know, and we want very much to encourage this to be a family uh, kind of function. Grandma and grandpa can join right in. They are speakers. It's the moms and dads in that childbearing age of 18 to 35, we want to really encourage them to utilize what crow they know and then have these family activities. And for heaven's sakes, turn off the TV <laughs> because <laughs> English is just everywhere, drowning out the sound of our own voices, our own thinking and our own interactions as family members. Um, so every time we get the chance, we say, turn off the TV reserve one or two or three nights a week where you have an hour or two where you just no no TV we're going to talk we're going to use the crow language so yeah. that's how they can be encouraged and i think that um when they know that there are 25 other families in a language learning night who're going to do this they can say i'm going to do this we're going to do this with our family and we're not going to stick out or seem strange it's the way we can encourage our children to speak Crow language. Yeah. Uh, at AHEX uh, Native Language Summit, which was held um, this past October, Howard Payton, the executive director of the Department of the Cherokee Language, discussed how the Cherokee Nation views total language immersion as a full-time endeavor. And so they've built homes for first speakers and even pay them a stipend. Now, obviously, not all tribes can afford to do this, but how can we better accommodate first speakers and those adult learners who you just mentioned who are all in and want to become fully fluent in their native language? Well, I think tribal colleges have an obligation to be respectful and observant of the language speakers in their community. We really uh, absolutely must regard our language speakers, our fluent speakers as treasures. And when you treasure something, 
you care for them, you re you uh, reward them, you recognize them. Uh, in every every community gathering, ask them to stand and have an applause for their presence among you. Uh, that has to be intentionally a part of every gathering. Now, it's true that most tribes probably don't have the resources to be sure they're properly housed, but there are ways in which, uh, you know, fluent speakers need to be recognized. They can be brought into events, they can, especially in tribal studies, but also in schools. Dire a directory of, of fluent speakers can be given to all of the schools, and they can come in and bring uh, presentations on various topics. It's just the way uh, Little Bighorn College has about um, 70 or 80 elders every so many years that have come in to share their knowledge, like the Crow Indian weddings or the warrior stories that they know or the songs that they sing in warrior societies or our religious traditions or place names. All of that kind of knowledge comes in with our fluent speakers. And our schools, our community organizations can come to understand what a wonderful um, series of knowledge that is to bring into our organization and feature it. Um, it is, it is a, a huge collection of knowledge keepers among our speakers. You know, we had a dictionary project at Crow, and we had about 80 speakers who responded to our call to work on a dictionary. And we found out that each and every fluent speaker has areas of expertise that are distinct than the next person. So we have men who have hunting knowledge of the land, of the, land, of the big game that they hunt, uh, of the sacred places in the mountains, but then we have other men who know how to train horses and all the horse uh, tack or gear and all the way in which horses are involved with the Crow people. Uh, over on the women's side, we have women who are very good at healing, uh, who have medicine for children and babies, um, and that other women are very expert in preparing foods and they know all that area, uh, that expertise. And it was 80 people, but the language they knew was entirely uh, different or distinct from one another. That kind of understanding of language, it's not just words, it's knowledge of the culture, knowledge of the history, knowledge of the literature, knowledge of the environment. Oh, it is a huge amount that uh, speakers can come and bring into the community. So I think the more every community can do in terms of understanding where that knowledge is and how it can be brought into the school setting, the community setting, women's groups, men's groups, the more respect and, you know, the treasuring of these speakers will be, and it, it'll be tremendous. It is, after we finished the dictionary, we had such enthusiasm for the language among the speakers. And we had a gr far greater appreciation of this special expertise that was throughout our community. It was marvelous. It was it was tremendous. Mm, that's great. Um, there's been this is kind of the unavoidable question that I'm going to ask you today. There's been an increasing amount of discussion on the role that artificial intelligence can play in language sustainability. What is your view on this? Technology is something that we have rolled into our materials in our classroom in a big way. Uh, we are currently developing a platform for conversation. And it's a tool that our learning community is just utilizing uh, at a rapid pace. And our dictionary is entirely interactive. Our dictionary, you look up a word and you can hear a man uh, hear it say that word and a woman say that word you can look at the definitions and so many of our young people are very adept at technology so being able to immediately have access to the word you're looking for right now and hear it 
in a, a man's voice, a, a man that you know, you might even recognize that man who's saying that or the woman, and uh, to be able to repeat it. So we're we're very uh, very reliant and have on technology in our language learning. I mean, some of these things that I'm telling you about, I didn't tell you before, but we're also developing a conversation learning platform, which is just so convenient to the classroom, so immediate to the learners. People 30 years and under are totally adept at technology. I, I imagine, I can imagine that uh, the uh, uh, artificial intelligence will begin to take a part in all of this. Um, it's going to be a matter of the creativity of all the teachers in our consortium and other places that will see how it can be used. Okay, thanks. Um, I've got one last question. Sometimes we don't want to face the fact that indigenous languages the world over are declining precipitously. This can be demoralizing and even traumatic so for younger tribal college leaders and language instructors, what advice and encouragement can you offer? Well, there are many settings in the tribal colleges, but in uh, tribal nations across, uh, across the United States and among the First Nations where revitalization efforts have been really seriously effective. And uh, if people are doubtful, they can take a trip, they can call people up in this entire language revitalization community and realize uh, that it revitalization can be done. Uh, it is not altogether easy, but when there's intention, uh, there's a way to learn uh, tribal languages. Uh, the one of the several approaches are so entirely accessible. Uh, the sign language with the tribal language is a way to learn 400 words. You can bring in the specialist, have one speaker, and the, the sign language specialist can sit down with the speaker and in about two days have 400 words with signs that are ready to go for families, for kids, for anybody in the community. And in no time at all, you can learn, for example, 50, I once uh, attended an Assiniboine session, learning with sign language, where the this room of 200 people learned 50 terms inside two hours. And we tested them, um, between, they were four-year-olds all the way to 60-year-olds, learned 50 terms. Language learning can be done. Is language loss traumatic? Absolutely. The loss of language uh, is like a lost loved one. It is as traumatic as losing your own brother or sister. And for many uh, American Indians, that they've never learned their language is, is a factor of trauma in their lives. And so it's something that brings them injury and damage. But it's also the case that language learning can occur and there are so many ways that have been creatively innovated and invented in our native communities. So, you know, I would say it certainly can be done. And language is more than just learning words. It's connection to land. It's kinship terms. It's clanship terms. It's traditions that are healing. Language has so much to offer. It's not just a stack of words. So, um, you know, there's histories that are conveyed in language, terms that go back to historical figures. Uh, there's inventions and technology that are terms that are in language. There's so much potential when you start learning language. So, you know, have them call me up. I can suggest any number of people they can call to say, oh, yeah, we taught our kids this much in this much time. And now we have kids that are praying in the language, that are telling stories in the language, that are singing lullabies in the language, and they know what they're saying. It's fabulous. I mean, there's so much that can be done. And it's it builds strength of heart. It builds strength of identity. It builds uh, membership in community and belonging. 
There's so much potential in language learning. So that's what I would say. Demoralized, okay, but talk to me. Talk to all these various activists in language revitalization. Um, you'll see that it's doable. It can be done. Well, that's great. And, you know, thank you so much for all that you have done sustaining our languages. And um, and uh, thanks for, for joining us today. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. Every opportunity I get to talk about Indigenous languages is just great. I I appreciate the, the chance. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll see you soon. Indeed. Hopefully okay. down the road here. All right. All right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Current Reflections is a production of Tribal College Journal of American Indian Higher Education. Thank you for listening. Now that I touch in in slow and shame, but she's chain, but I need to say, top on the Chanel. I am Marvin Tom, the subscription manager for the Tribal College Journal. Today, tribal colleges and universities are uplifting Native communities, and Tribal College Journal is their voice. So don't hesitate. Subscribe to the Tribal College Journal today and help support American Indian higher education. For just $29, you will receive our quarterly publication, plus the annual edition of TCJ Student, which features creative writing and art. It is as easy as a quick phone call or email. You can reach me at 970-764-4238 or at marvine at tribalcollegejournal.org. I look forward to hearing from you. Ahiha.